Well, hello and welcome back to another beautiful episode of the Well-Read Christian Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Stanley, as always. Before I get into it, I want to nauseatingly say once more that there are ways that you can support the podcast. If you're enjoying it and you're interested in where the podcast could go in the future, on all of the books that I could be talking about, the ideas that I could explore, the guests that I could entertain, the creators I could collaborate with, Man, the future is just so exciting. Well, I can't get anywhere as long as there are only two people listening to the podcast. And, I, and there aren't really. I, I am actually really impressed with the numbers. I'm, I'm so thrilled that so many of you are listening. And, and, uh, but anyway, before I get off track, this show could really go somewhere. And, and I need the positive feedback. I need the, I need the negative feedback. I, I, I need all of the feedback I can get. So if you really want to help, here's what you can do. Go to iTunes, and since you've already subscribed, I don't need to tell you to do that, of course. Leave a five-star review and tell me what you actually think of the podcast. Positive things, leave on iTunes. Negative things, um, write me a letter and then put it in the garbage can. No, just kidding. No, right? Uh, in all actual seriousness, it, it, even if you have negative things to say, um, I would absolutely love to hear them. There's a contact page on the website. It's right there in the menu bar. Um, and seriously, like, you know, hey man, your outro music is way too loud, or you really need to work on summarizing your points after you've made them because you just start talking and I forget what you're saying by the time you're done saying it, like stuff like that, whatever it is, you know, I, I, I need that kind of help if I'm going to continue to improve as a communicator and, and allow the show to grow in a interesting and productive and beautiful way. And also remember, um, my Facebook page and the Twitter page that I meticulously run, and nobody's there. There is no reason why you shouldn't hit the like button. And you know what? I'm even going to be so bold as to ask that you hit the share button. Because the truth is, is that your friends can check it out too, and maybe they'll enjoy it. And you don't have to be a Christian like the podcast. You just have to have a brain. And I'm pretty sure that all of your Facebook friends have a brain. And so, as long as I don't resemble your annoying nephew that you see every Christmas, share it on Facebook. Or tell a friend, you know, if, if the conversation warrants it, uh, I'm not asking you to be a pest about it. But if we can get the word out, this show could really go places, and I'm very excited about the prospects of that. Okay, enough of that. Today I want to talk a little more about the Great Conversation. And this is a concept that I mentioned in episode 5. It was titled The Beauty of Christianity. So you'll get to hear a little more there if you go back and listen to that. And in the context of a poet, I said that creators throughout time are inspired by one another. And they respond to one another's works. And it creates a, a flow of art and science and philosophy and writing and fiction and all of these things. And as the creators of the world bounce off of one another, the end result is culture. Because these ideas trickle down and they impact all of our lives and and the media that we consume in a 21st century uh, mode, but also in a throughout all time. And we as human beings are constantly watching plays and reading books and being inspired by these creators who are inspiring one another and then inspiring the next generation of creators. This is how cultural progress is achieved. One group of thinkers inspiring another group of younger thinkers who inspire the next group of thinkers, or artists, or playwrights, or whatever it is. This is actually how cultural regress is achieved too, by the way. There's really, really bad art, or bad content, bad thinking, and it inspires even worse content, and worse art, and worse thinking. And so there's a battle there, there's a balance, there's a back and forth. But you get the idea. This move forward, whether it's a positive or a negative direction, is because the great conversation continues at all times, and it's always continued. You can take a part of this conversation and enjoy it yourself. Yes, you. You don't have to get on the dance floor, but you can be a spectator, a wallflower, there to enjoy the show that is called the human race. I don't mean their awful dance moves. I mean their ideas. And let me tell you this, this is one event that you don't want to miss, the play of life, the exploration 
of what it means to be human. The perspectives of others. There are some amazing parts in the theater of the human race. I sincerely cannot believe the amount of people who will die without ever reading War and Peace. That is truly sad to me, and I know I go on and on about that book. But I don't know how people live their life without being excited about the fact that there's a rich history of conversations dating back since the birth of Western civilization. And all these minds throughout time have been preserved for us to enjoy and analyze and become clearer thinkers on behalf of reading their works. And we just don't. And I think that's because people just don't know better. They don't even know where to begin. And that's where I'd really like to step in. I would like this podcast to be a center for beautiful music and beautiful poetry and beautiful artwork and beautiful literature and beautiful ideas to find a home so that you could go, well, it's all overwhelming and I don't know where to go or where to begin, but I don't really mind listening to the Well Art Christian podcast. And if you were a regular listener, I hope that you will continue to gain more and more exposure to beautiful music and beautiful literature and beautiful ideas in a way that can enrich your life so that you don't feel like you have to go to your nearest library and, you know, spin around seven times and throw a dart and hurt some child and then go up and steal his book and try to read it. Because that is obviously not a good way to be exposed to the great conversation. So all random acts of violence aside, I really want Welder Christian to be a center for those kind of beautiful things. And, and anyway, to get us back on track with the conversation, I, I want to make an observation about the great conversation about painters and artists and, and literary figures and philosophers. And, and, and this is interesting. Most of the time, it's the artists and the painters who get it right first. They're on the cutting edge. They see something in the world, some truth, some reality, and it's so vivid and powerful to them, and it's abstract in all of its collection of ideas and thoughts that are, that are just barely forming, and they can't even put it into words, but maybe they could express it with a paintbrush. And then the poets and the writers see what has been painted, and they go, whoa. I get it. I see that too. Maybe that's even a subconscious experience. And then they write their books and their poems. And then the philosophers take up the rear. And they go, okay, I see what you all are saying. All right, I get it. And then they explain it a little more fully, a little more thoroughly. And thus culture marches on as the rest of us then look at the paintings and we read the books and we are impacted by the poems and the plays and the films and the music and then of course the philosophers. And let me give you an example of this. I think this will be worthwhile. In 1907, Picasso painted a painting. And this is an absolutely brilliant painting. Probably not one that you'd want to hang on your wall, but brilliant nonetheless. Because Picasso saw what was happening to modern man at the turn of the 20th century. Modern man was becoming deconstructed, d dissected, and in a sense, obliterated. Our conception of what it means to be human was dissolving before our eyes. And how can you communicate that? What are you going to say? How can you get every shade of emotion and truth and wonder into one expression? I could barely do it just describing it, what he meant to say right now. You'd have to look at it yourself. Well, if you're a painter, you communicate with color, with texture, with depth, with images, with symbols that represent ideas that are conjured up in the mind and expressed on paper. And so Picasso began to paint. And when Picasso was finished, it was called De Moisoué de Avignon. I butchered that, but it was a good try. Painted in 1907. And this is a painting of the inside of a prostitution house in Barcelona. On the left-hand side of the painting, the forms are naked and unashamed and immoral creatures, women, expressed in a fairly natural form. Even if their appearance is discomforting, it's generally, you know, 
normal for Picasso. But towards the center of the painting, the forms of the women begin to look broken up. They begin to look primitive, savage, frightening. And then finally, on the right-hand side of the painting, the figures have been completely disassembled into masks and symbols and broken images and body parts, distorted faces and darker, disturbing figures. Picasso expressed the nature of modern man. Monsters, human subjects. He painted the world as he saw it. The result was a terrifying work that chilled his companions and friends to the core. And he knew what he had done. And for a moment, as one commentator put it, the world stood still. T.S. Eliot did a similar thing with poetry. T.S. Eliot was hailed as a hero of modern poetry in 1922 when he published his work, The Wasteland. To quote another commentator, for the first time, sorry, this is a quote, quote, for the first time he dared to make the form of his poetry fit the nature of the world as he saw it, namely broken, unrelated, ruptured, a collection of shattered fragments of language and images and illusions drawn seemingly haphazardly from all manner of literature and philosophy and religious writings from the ancients to the present, end quote. And then now here come the modern philosophers, like Jean-Francois Lyotard. I think I butchered his name too, but it was a good try. And he articulated fully that modern man was broken, and any narrative that seeks to explain and understand all of life in a grand meta-narrative is almost certainly wrong. And he was one of the first and most influential postmodernists. I usually read his name. I, I don't know how to say it. So do you see it? Do you see how all of these people are looking at the horizon and the painter, in my example, Picasso, sees something and he paints about it. And then Eliot, the poet, also sees the same thing and he writes poetry about it. And then finally, Leotard, the philosopher, brings up the rear and he fully articulates the ideas that the previous artists had communicated. And Philosophy is actually overtly stru structured in a way that reflects the great conversation. The definition of philosophy can actually be deemed the study of philosophers. Because if you think about it, what do philosophers write about? Philosophers who came before them. Literature and poetry sometimes pretend like they're not influenced by one another because they want to be original. But philosophers gain originality in another way. They gain originality by responding to and refuting whoever came before them. So Plato builds off of and refutes Socrates, and then Aristotle learns from and then refutes Plato. And then Alexander learns from Aristotle and conquers the known world. And so Greek ideas spread and collide into other ideas, and those kind of mix and fold and mold and develop over time into the ideas that we have today. And one of the things that you might not know about the Great Conversation is that there's a huge rivalry between poets and philosophers. Now, to be clear, when I say poets, I mean writers of fiction, primarily. I mean artists, visionaries. The technical term for their craft is called poesy, the craft of fiction. And this rivalry has existed since the beginning of Western civilization. And it's actually understandable when you think about it, because both philosophers and poets I'm just going to call them poets. I still don't know what other term to use. Writers of fiction and philosophers, they both contain and are vying for the attention of everybody else in a contest to see who can better explain reality. They're in the same arena. Who has the better take on the way things really are? Because really, that's what everyone is trying to do. We're all trying to get a fix on what is going on in the world. Some of us at specific moments, others in a meta-narrative. The first example of this, at least that I'm aware of, is found in Plato's Republic, one of the first works of Western philosophy. For those who are unfamiliar, Plato's Republic is basically this philosopher named Plato. He was a Greek, one of the first great thinkers, perhaps one of the greatest thinkers of all time, at least I certainly think so. 
and he gave an explanation of what the best possible government and society would look like. If you could wipe out everything and start fresh, how would you build it so that it was optimal? Well, there's a lot that could be said about Plato's Republic, but what I want to say right now is that Plato bans poetry and he executes poets. He just says, get those people out of here. Get rid of those guys, those freaks in funny clothes who babble on about nonsense that nobody can interpret. They don't help anybody. They just corrupt the youth and make everybody try and feel stuff. But it's all just cheesy and imprecise, and it's no good. It's worthless. Well, that's not the definitive statement from Greek culture, of course. The Greek playwrights have contributed some of the best that our civilization has to offer. But the point still stands that Plato, as a philosopher, did not like the court jesters who he believed poets were basically trying to be. Go write your children's stories and your fairy tales, but leave the real thinking to us. So there's your philosopher's perspective, kind of given the first stab. And uh, here comes Sir Philip Sidney, all the way 1579, many, many, many years later, who is an English playwright and lover of fiction. And he lived in an era where Christian Puritans had essentially declared war on the theater. They said that it was a place for pickpockets and prostitutes, and a true Christian would avoid such a place. It's always better to be reading your Bible or something anyway. This, by the way, marks a sharp and rare difference between me and the Puritans. I love the Puritans and their legacy, and, and not, of course, what they are portrayed by and in through maybe the images that are conjured up by the media or some book that you read once that was about something else entirely. Um, but I mean the actual theology and the, the piety and the true beauty of the mind that those Puritans really strove for. But anyway, they didn't like the theater. They didn't like fiction. And I could not disagree more. And so here comes Sir Philip Sidney, my hero, the Puritan who loves the theater. And he comes as the counterculture to write an essay titled The Defense of Posey. And one of the things he argues is that fiction is very much worthwhile. As a matter of fact, fiction is the most important thing a culture could study and revere. I wrote about this in my article, Why Read Classic Literature. So if you're interested in his arguments for why fiction is the most important thing you could study, and some great quotes, go read the blog. Some of my thoughts are there. It's a pretty great article, if I do say so myself. Shameless plugging aside, in the defense of Posey, Sidney argues that literature and fiction is the most important thing you could learn in school, and it's the most important branch of the humanities that you could study, and he anticipates the objection that philosophy is going to be better. It's more grown up. It's more mature. Set down these silly books, and let's talk about the ideas like men. Just say what you mean and mean what you say. Enough of this poetic nonsense. Well, what Sidney says in response to this is a diss of all the ages. Or it's, a, it's a diss for the books. It's amazing. As someone who loves philosophy, I absolutely love how Sidney just rips these guys. He dishes it out against the philosophers in a hilarious and powerful way. He says, really? You want to learn from philosophy instead of reading these incredible works of fiction? Okay, fine. Go learn from Aristotle. Pick up his 800-page metaphysics and tell me what you think after that. Those philosophers will bore you to tears before you can even start to pretend to learn anything that applies to real life. Check out this quote. Quote, A principal challenger to step forth is the moral philosophers, whom, methinketh, I see coming towards me with a sullen gravity, as though they could not abide vice by daylight. Rudely clothed, for to witness outwardly their contempt of outward things with books in their hands against glory, whereto they set their names, sophistically speaking, against subtlety, and angry with any man in whom they see the foul fault of anger. These men, casting large shadows as they go, of definitions, divisions, and distinctions, with scornful interrogative do soberly ask whether it be possible to find any path so ready to lead a man to virtue as that which teacheth what virtue is, end quote. 
So he talks a little bit like Captain Barbosa in Pirates of the Caribbean, so you'll have to forgive the old English. But in case you missed it, he is absolutely making fun of these guys. He goes, oh, I see, the moral philosopher. That's who you want to teach you? With your with their bent over backs and their beards that touch their knees and their books that they never close with dark covers. They walk around sullenly with frowny faces and look down their noses at you because they have the contempt for all of life in the outside world. They're just in their ivory tower that doesn't even exist and so it's trapped in their brain and all the rest of the world is rubbish. They'll lecture you all day long about what virtue is and about what vice is and how you must master your passions and blah, 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 blah. And they can't even decide what these terms mean. How are you going to learn anything from them? How are they going to teach you anything? It's just tables and charts and definitions and talking and circles. But if you let me tell you a story about a man who was so angry he killed every Trojan he saw for miles until his seething rage blinded him so badly that a cowardly weasel of a man shot an arrow and he missed and hit his heel, and he accidentally found his weak spot, and he killed him. Well, I'd wager you would learn a thing or two about the virtues of courage and strength and heroism as opposed to the vices of rage and pettiness and cowardice. But it's not just Plato and Sidney, with the rivalry, I mean. I can't help but mention Tolstoy and the historians, too. You have this incredible visionary of an author, Tolstoy, against the philosophical historians who are just trying to tell you what the facts are. I mean, heck, the entire book of War and Peace was Tolstoy going back and saying, yeah, the historians are absolutely wrong about this. They blame Napoleon for war, and they... they assign his cunning and brilliance to his tactical strategies. But Napoleon did not carry thousands of ammunitions on his back. He didn't shoot hardly any Russians at all, if any. No, it was regular Frenchmen who did that. By the thousands. Let me tell you how it really happened. It had very little to do with Napoleon. I'll just go ahead and say that right off the bat. He takes on every historian of the era and calls them out for what he saw to be just not good characterizations about what reality was really like. And the only way he could capture that truth and communicate it so that you, reading the book all these years later because I told you to, can know what the War of 1812 was really like. Not reading a set of facts, but you could be there. You could live it. And he did that with a novel. And historians today are still bickering about the facts and portrayals in War and Peace. And philosophers are still grappling with Tolstoy's view of free will and the inevitability of history based on prior causes and events. You know, Nietzsche said something that's interesting. He said that any real artist or philosopher worth their salt is totally disconnected from the ordinary world. He pointed out that true visionaries and thinkers and artists throughout time they don't usually get married. They don't do the whole work the farm, have seven children, three of them die, the other four take care of you, and then you get old and die. Instead, they're the strange black sheep that nobody really understands or appreciates until years after they're dead and buried. If philosophers were scientists, literature would be their laboratory. That was important. In case you missed it, I'm going to say it again. If philosophers were scientists, literature would be their laboratory. Now, scientists have to write out their ideas and essays and papers and such. And so, nonfiction is like the desk of the philosopher. But fiction is the laboratory of the philosopher. So the philosopher, if he was a scientist, would perform his experiments in the world of fiction, in his laboratory. And then he'd write about his findings in an essay, or a paper, or in nonfiction. That's my idea, anyway. I think it's a good one. And I really think that some ideas have a hard time being explained without both. Especially literature, because literature can show you ideas. Philosophy defines them, literature shows them. 
Literature is the savior of the abstractions of the philosopher once they're too far removed from reality. Literature can show you what words cannot tell you. Then that will lead you to some wacky ideas about what words are, by the way, since literature is just a bunch of words, right? <laughs> but there's a difference. There's a difference between the imagination of fiction, which fuels storytelling and narrative. There's a difference between that and the analytical part of your brain that studies nonfiction and puts together arguments and abstractions of philosophy, like a scientific paper or a book on science in general. And good gracious, I'm so thankful for literature because so many philosophers have the stupidest metaphors. Man, if I have to listen to someone say that 2 plus 2 equals 4 in order to make some point about truth or objectivity or something one more time, I'm going to go crazy. I can get so tired of the philosopher that only sees in theorems and premises and they cannot see the beauty of fiction. And so the truth is that both the poet and the philosopher occupy the same space. And even though there's a little bit of a gentle rivalry, or at sometimes not so gentle of a rivalry, normal people like you and me can enjoy the interaction between all of the arts. All right, I'm ready to move on. There's a really powerful point that I want to make in this episode, and it has to do with Jesus. Love him or hate him, whether you're a Christian or not, you cannot deny that Jesus was a powerful and profound teacher. Even if he doesn't impact you all that much, he impacted thousands of people so powerfully that they went on to impact millions and billions of people after them. So I'd like to say he did something right when it comes to inspiring people and communicating the way he saw the world. So whether you agree or not, I think we can learn from Jesus' mode of communication and the way that he communicated to people and the way that he impacted people. I had a professor uh, in college who made this point powerfully, so I'm just going to straight up rip him off, basically. Thank you, Dr. Grant Horner, for this. This is for you. I remember he asked his class this question, and it was so good. He said, how many of you can remember the book of Romans? Point by point, letter from Paul chapter by chapter, and how many of you could reconstruct it from memory? And he paused. Nobody. Okay, how many can just tell me some ideas in Romans, some notable quotes from the book of Romans? And some people suggested things, and they, they had things to say. But then he said, well, how many of you could tell me every important part of the story of the prodigal son? And basically, everyone raised their hands. He said, you see, you remember, and it's powerful, and you've thought about it. He also pointed out that he could probably begin any parable that Jesus gave, and most of those students could finish it. And it's not just because they're Bible students or they go to a Bible college. It's because those stories are memorable. He pointed out that you can create this massive dialogue of arguments and objections and counter-objections until you're blue in the face. And you can write clearly and define your terms and build off your premises. And people will forget all about it. They're just bored. But if you look at Jesus and you hear him say, there was a man who was beat up and robbed and left for dead on the road. And a Pharisee passed by him and did not stop. And a Levite passed by him and did not stop. But a Samaritan, a ceremonially unclean, racially inferior, filthy Samaritan, scooped him up and took him to an inn and paid for his medical treatment. Who do you think showed that man true love? Well, there you go. There's a powerful story. And from then on, you know what Jesus means when he says, love your neighbor. The person who's beyond your racial divide, the person who it's really not your responsibility to help them, the person who is completely helpless, that's the person who you give everything for. Now, that's a powerful view of love. And Jesus taught moral truths with narrative 
because it was powerful. It got the point across in a way that struck the hearers dumbfounded. Many times, the people who ask Jesus questions are completely baffled with his answers. And many times, he answers people with stories. The power of narrative is incredible. And you're not going to be sorry if you read more high-quality fiction. So in conclusion of our time spent examining art, poetry, fiction, and philosophy, I want to conclude with a profound thought. Here it is. Ideas are things that are not thought. They are lived. Ideas are not things you think. They are things that you do. They are things that you are. What are you, if not a collection of incoherent ideas playing themselves out every morning when you wake up and every night as you fall asleep? Ideas are expressed in actions. Ideas manifest themselves in our lives. Most people, I wager, are not even conscious of the ideas that possess them. Every single action you perform, especially the mundane and the knee-jerk, are expressions of ideas that live inside of you. Do I buy this milk or that milk? Well, this milk will make me fat. It's whole milk. Better buy that milk. Why? Well, because I don't want to be fat. Well, why? Because I want people to like me and think I'm attractive. Well, how much are you willing to sacrifice for that? Clearly, your choice of milk. But what else? If you're at a party, or someone is at a party, let's say, and they're offered drugs, and they say to themselves, eh, what the heck, and they take it. The idea that's being expressed in that moment, it could be a series of things. It could mean, I want the people around me to accept me, so I better do it. Or, more likely, it could be an expression of a deep belief that nothing matters, and I don't care what happens to me, as long as I have a good time along the way. <laughs> and you'll pick that up among people who say, why not, a lot. Well, why not? Why, why would we do that? Well, why not? If that isn't nihilism in action, I don't know what is. It's just a perpetual pursuit of the next fun thing. And you don't really care what happens along the way, as long as you have a good time. That's nihilism. You see, I have said before that there are thoughtful people and there are unthoughtful people. And that's certainly true. But what I mean by that is that there are some people who know what ideas drive them. And they try to control those ideas by analyzing them and keeping an eye on their motives and steering their decisions. And then there are other people who just do whatever they feel like in the moment. And those people are absolute slaves. They are slaves to someone else's ideas, puppets to whatever cultural or societal whim. And what poets and philosophers and novel writers are trying to do is capture those ideas. They're trying to take them and infuse them on a page so that you can read it or see it and understand. And sometimes it looks like a painting or a novel or an essay. But in each case, they are grasping at something immaterial. And you can grab a hold of that yourself and measure it and weigh it and add it to your own experience. You can learn to decipher true ideas that match the world and distinguish them from ideas that are dangerous and will harm you and people around you. It's like magic, really. You can be a wizard of ideas and you can command them and understand them. Or... You can be subject to them. And what artists and philosophers and writers are trying to do is articulate those ideas in a way that you can understand. Some are more understandable than others. Some are more beautiful than others. But their goals are the same. And this conversation between ideas and expressions of ideas is beautiful and worthwhile. And that's my project. And that's what I'm trying to persuade you of and and lure you towards. And I hope that you join me and that you continue to join me in the journey for beauty and truth. 
Thank you for listening to the Wild Christian Podcast. I'll see you next time. And when I step in, I am going to teach you how to be incredible. Because the truth is, is that if you're incredible, you can be Mr. Incredible. And if you're Mr. Incredible, you'll meet a Mrs. Incredible. And if you meet a Mrs. Incredible, you have a baby like Jack-Jack and nobody will babysit for you. And that'll be a problem. So do you want to do that? No. So don't listen. Or listen. But either way, you'll end up with a baby like (laughs) Jack-Jack. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha.